Namasabhayai Sabhapati Bhyascha. I am Brinda Karanam, your MC for this evening. A very warm welcome to all of you. Swagatam. We shall begin today's program with Deepojvalanam or lighting of the lamp, which is symbolic of dispelling the darkness of ignorance with the light of jnana. I am pleased to invite Swami Sarvapriyanandaji, resident Swami and the head of Vedanta Society New York, Swami Samachittanandaji, president Ramakrishna Mission Singapore, Shri Rajan Krishnanji, chairman Hindu Endowments Board, Shri Senguttuvanji, chairman Hindu Advisory Board, Shri Amit Khandelwalji, committee member, Malwa Cultural Association, and Shri Srinivasanji, chairman of Gita Jayanti Singapore, to join us on stage for lighting the lamp. Deepajyoti param brahma Deepajyoti parantapaha Deepajyoti param jnanam Deepadevyai namo namaha Deepajyoti Param Brahma Deepajyoti Parantapaha Deepajyoti Parangyanam Deepadevyai Namo Namaha Deepajyoti Param Brahma Deepajyoti parantapaha Deepajyoti parangyanam Deepadevyai namo namaha I invite Srimati Padmini Chandrasekharji to render the invocation prayers. Krishnaya Keshavaya Om Namo Namo Vrishnikula Bhushanaya Om Namo Namo Krishnaya Keshavaya Om Namo Namo Vrishnikula Bhushanaya Om Namo Namo Adi Devaya Anantarupaya Anandaya Amritaya Adbhutaya Cha Satya Rupaya Padmanabhaya Pavitraya Prasannaya Papaharaya Krishnaya Keshavaya Om Namo Namo Vrishnikula Bhushanaya Om Namo Namo Mukundaya Madhavaya Manmathaya Cha Mohanaya Mangalaya Madhuraya Cha Vamanaya Vallabhaya Vasudevaya 
वरप्रदाय वेकटा ओम नमो नमो कृष्णाय केशवाय ओम नमो नमो वृष्णिकूलभूषणाय ओम नमो नमो ओम नमो नमो ओम नमो नमो थैंक यू श्रीमती पद्मिनी जी फॉर द वेरी सोलफुल रेंडिशन इन्वोकिंग भगवान गीताचार्य आई नाउ रिक्वेस्ट श्री जी श्रीनिवासन जी Chairman Geeta Jayanti Singapore to deliver the welcome address. Hari Om. Pooja Sri Swami Sarvapriyananda ji. पूज्य श्री स्वामी समचितानंद जी श्री राजन कृष्ण जी चेयरमैन हिंडू एंड बोनमेंट्स बोर्ड श्री सेंगटुअन जी चेयरमैन हिंडू एडवाइजरी बोर्ड श्री सेल्वम जी चेयरमैन श्रीनिवास परमाल टेंपल ऑल अवर डिस्टिंग्विश्ड पार्टनर ऑर्गेनाइजेशन हेड्स एंड द इनकमिंग पार्टनर ऑर्गेनाइजेशन लीड ऑर्गेनाइजेशन ऑन नेक्स्ट ईयर बींग रिप्रेजेंट बाय Shrimati Sarojini Devi and Malini Parame Sivaraman from Sri Krishna Temple, as well as all district guests, brothers and sisters, it gives us a great pleasure to welcome you to one other edition of uh, International Gita Forum, and we are very grateful to Swami Sarvapriyananda Ji for making a detour, not a small one. very very long one he was supposed to go from us to london but at our request he is just deviating via singapore not an easy joke i would say <laughs> so thank you swami ji our grateful sincere gratitude filled pranams for accommodating our request <laughs> to be with us to share your pulse of wisdom with us we are also happy to have all of you today with us Gita Jayanti, as you know, is a very unique combination, not so easily found elsewhere, even found for a particular occasion. Over now, 27 organizations are coming together in Singapore to celebrate the message of uh, spread and celebrate the message of Gita to all the people all over the Singapore. And now, with the after the COVID pandemic, even across the globe to over all other places. it's not easy because some people may come for one occasion all get come together and then they disperse thereafter but to come year long year after year after for last 24 years signifies symbolizes the power of gita to all of us and this year the lead organization is malwa cultural association there they may be a nascent society but the enthusiasm and support and involvement of them is very 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 encouraging and very very uh, <coughs> uh, appreciable thanks a lot for being involved in our <laughs> and in case the name sounds little unfamiliar to somebody malwa is represents the madhya pradesh region in, in india <coughs> because that's a thing and that's another thing of the beauty of the geeta jayanti is that is able to bring across various ethnic organizations that are found in singapore to come and join and take the message to gita to everywhere you may be wondering why gita what is so significant about it i mean everybody has talked about it everybody knows about it but it still remains very relevant today in as much as a video that went viral recently the well regarded highly accomplished neurosurgeon in from mumbai dr p v ramani p s ramani he quotes that the food prescribed in gita by bhagwan is more than enough to cure most of your illnesses so that is the power of thing and uh, i could even recall one time our even our guest of honor for one of the gita igf forum earlier on dr uh, i mean mr jayam pulley 
the financial architect of modern Singapore, as well as the former chairman of Singapore Airlines. He is on record quoting that he refers to both these are very often for his management techniques and lessons. So, and <clears throat> that's the power of Gita. And I could even say that Swami Vivekananda also got inspired with very much worth it. And when he delivered that famous address in um, Chicago and was highly appreciated, he wrote a letter to his, one of his staunch devotees in Chennai called Alasinga Perumal and expressing that what has happened is nothing but mukam karvati vachalam, that's what he quotes. He says, it's Krishna says that it, he made me speak all this and made Hinduism to be brought to the fore of the world attention and audience. Incidentally, Alasinga Perumal is, let me digress a bit, Alasinga Perumal is a very staunch devotee, a very small teacher in Chennai who was also instrumental in getting Swamiji to Chicago conference. And he collected not only a princely sum of donation at that time, when Swamiji arrived a little earlier in Chicago and ran short of money, he even collected further donations and sold his wife's jewelry to fund it. So we are immensely indebted to noble people like that forever for bringing the Hinduism to the forefront through Swami Vivekananda. So coming back, so this is the relevance of Gita to all the people all the time. So Gita Jayanti attempts to bring Gita to all the people in Singapore by various means, chanting, <coughs> what do you call, um, competitions, art, and um, even cultural expressions and everything. And one of the other things is also in Gita Forum that brings the knowledge to you. You may find Gita is relevant, and that's why you're gathered here, but not many other regards so much. That's why Gita Jayanti is doing all that, and Gita, International Gita Forum is one such uh, occasion where the knowledge is imparted to the people who are the seekers of the Gita beyond the chanting into the spiritual aspect of it. I could say that a small incident that quoted by Swami Vivekananda in one of his, uh, found in the collections of um, Swami Vivekananda, I read long ago, that he says at one time, a tramp, not to be confused with somebody else, he says that he was well, asking an old man going, I mean, not moving around here and there, and then asking an old man in front of the house, what is the direction to a particular village nearby? The old man never, ever answered him. Then he went back and forth, and then finally, when he was about to set off to a particular direction, the old man called him and told him, okay, this is the way to go. Then that, uh, that fellow tramp was surprised. He says, I've been asking you for so long and you never even bothered to tell me about anything. Now when I'm setting up, now you are telling me. He says, that shows your commitment. So better I tell you when you are committed, not when you are haggling and hand ring and everything. So that's, way, that's why when you are, the Gita Forum is also an attempt. When you want to come and seek, it gives you, brings a lot of, old people, not to be mixed, not to be taken literally, a lot of old people in the sense that with by age, experience, knowledge, and everything. So they bring them, and in various formats, International Gita Forum has seen over the last 15 years several speakers who have shared their knowledge, and it has immensely benefited the audience who have been repeatedly coming to hear s those people. And <coughs> we are fortunate that it even had several kind of formats, it had at one time four speakers in one day to one speaker for four days in the last year. So that's the kind of transformation we have. At the organization level, we may be wondering whether are we having any benefit, fruitful for all this. I could definitely say that yes, the level of questions that have been being posed to Swamiji's or the speakers every time have risen above and above and above bringing more and forth, showing the depth of the audience and the participants in the spiritual path. Thank you very much. And a wall is a very well-regarded term in cricket, but I know it's not here. So without being a further anything, I would offer our sincere pranams, collective sincere pranams to Swamiji and welcome you all once more to this International Gita Forum 2023. Thank you and have a blessed and a blissful evening for the next three days. Jai Sri Krishna. Thank you, Srinivasanji.
I now invite Pujya Swami Sarvapriyanand Ji and Sri Rajan Krishan Ji on stage. Shri Rajan Krishnan Ji will now extend our Hritpurvaka pranams and respectful welcome to Swami Ji. The most awaited moment for this evening has indeed arrived. Sri Shankara Bhagavat Padacharya says in his Viveka Chudamani, Durlabham Trayame Vaitatu Daivanugraha Hetukam Manushyatvam Mumukshutvam Mahapurusha Samshrayaha. Three things indeed are very difficult to attain and are obtained only by divine grace. Human birth, longing for liberation and resort to a Mahapurusha or great sage. It is indeed by sheer divine grace and compassion of our Pujya Swamiji, who even took a detour to be with us today, that today we have an opportunity to be blessed by his divine words. Without any further ado, over to you Swamiji. Swami Sarvapriyanandaji will now deliver his lecture on the topic Supreme Empowerment based on Chapter 2 or Sankhya Yoga of Srimad Bhagavad Gita. Oh, Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityurma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Om, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness unto light, lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. Namaste and good evening everybody. Revered Swami Samachitanandaji Maharaj, the authorities of Gita Jayanti, the Hindu Endowment Board, and our host institution today, this, uh, the Srinivas Perumal Temple, the authorities who have uh, provided us with this wonderful uh, hall uh, in this gorgeous setting. Our gratitude to all of them for making this possible. Can you hear me clearly? Is a little bit of an echo somewhere? So can you just adjust the microphone? Yes. All right. Yeah, that's good. So the subject, the title was given as Supreme Empowerment. And I was thinking, what an apt title this is. See, we all need help in life. And religion and spirituality is the greatest help. These are not two separate things. That here is the Srinivas Perumal temple, all those rites and rituals are going on. That's one thing and outside is the vast teeming city of Singapore and your lives, your day-to-day -day lives. No, this secular life and spiritual life, they are actually not two separate things. Religion, spirituality is the most practical endeavor. Many people miss this, that's why especially among young people, uh, parents, uh, elders are unable to convey this convincingly to young people. And they ask the question, what's the use of it all? And the use is great. There's a great use. Swami Vivekananda said, Vedanta, as a philosophy, came later. It was practical first and philosophy second. Where was it taught? 
it's not without any reason that Vedanta is projected as having been taught, Bhagavad Gita is seen as having been taught in the battlefield. It was not taught in a hall like this or in a Vedanta school or in ashram. No, in the middle of the battlefield. And there's a reason why it has been portrayed in that way. That in the midst of our most difficult circumstances in life, in the worst circumstances in life, can this help us? Can this sustain us? Can this give us empowerment, uh, supreme empowerment? So this is the promise of religions. Vivekananda put it in very stark, bold, uncompromising terms. If the religion cannot wipe the tears of a widow, if religion cannot lift a little bit of bread to the lips of a hungry man, I don't care for that religion. If it promises you will go to heaven after death, but cannot help you in this life, I don't care for such a religion. Religion, spirituality should be able to and is able to help us here and now. Vivekananda further pointed out, see, this Vedanta, Upanishads, Gita, they are the same thing, same message. It was discussed, taught and practiced by kings and emperors. He said in those days, kings and emperors were, uh, uh, you know, people with enormous responsibilities. They were not figureheads, King Charles III or something like that. That's one thing, symbolic. But they are people with enormous responsibilities. And if they found time for Upanishads, for Gita, for spirituality, it is because, because they were people of, of uh, they demanded results. They were people with uh, uh, very little uh, time left to waste. So they found it useful in their lives. And that's why they pursued it. Sri Ramakrishna put it very simply. Whatever you may do in life, it's like gathering a series of zeros. But unless you have the one, the zeros have no value. You may gather, we may gather um, degrees and wealth and achievements and family and uh, Facebook likes and so many things we may gather. But all we'll, we'll find not satisfactory, not fulfilling. And everything we are moving from as if from one crisis to another crisis. When you have that one, one central power or source of power in our lives, then you will find it all makes sense. Then every zero will become more valuable. You, one plus one zero is 10 or 100 or 1,000 and 10,000, its value keeps on increasing. So this is the, the argument for, uh, for spirituality. Why do we need spirituality? Not a theoretical thing, not a luxury, not a just mere ritual which our parent or grandparents used to do, we have no use for, big mistake. And one that we will learn, unfortunately, to our great, um, you know, with great pain and sacrifice, we will have to learn this lesson. I think every generation has to go through this and then learn this lesson again. That there is something very deeply worthwhile in these spiritual endeavors. So Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna, the disciple, he comes to Krishna in a crisis. Notice, in the Upanishads, the scene is different. The student usually comes to the teacher with some very deep philosophical question. Who am I? What is this world? What is the purpose of life? Some very great philosophical question. In the Mundaka Upanishad, the student comes, Shaunaka. Kasminu bhagavo vigyate sarvamidam vigyatam bhavati iti. What is that one thing by knowing which sir, I can know everything. So, Nachiketa, a little boy, goes to the house of Yama, the lord of death, in Kathopanishad, and asks this question, what's the mystery of death? What's beyond death? So, wonderful questions. We all ask these questions. But Arjuna did not have these questions. He had a most practical question. What do I do now? My life is falling apart. I have been put into a horrible situation. Again and again we are put into horrible situations. Can spirituality help us? It can. Actually it can. Most of us don't know this. I remember at the beginning of the, uh, of the COVID, somebody said, I was in New York at that time, somebody said, please give a talk at this, some, this new situation has come, everything is going into quarantine. And at that time New York was the worst hit in the whole world. I remember per day, there were more than 1,000 casualties, deaths, in one city, in New York only, in Manhattan, per day. 
the total lockdown. People had no idea what is this disease, what's going on, no idea. So I gave a talk on Vedanta and uh, how it can help us. I remember one reaction came. Somebody asked, in the midst of this great crisis, now we have to do philosophy. As if, see the psychology, as if when everything is all right, uh, it's a luxury. I can go to an art show, a concert, or a lecture on Vedanta, it's fine. But in the middle of a pressure, lot of trouble, life is falling apart, society seems to be falling apart, my future is uncertain. In that, I have to listen to philosophy. It is only then that philosophy becomes useful. It's only then that Vedanta becomes useful. It's only then you get solace, comfort, strength, peace of mind to face life. You get empowerment. That's why we come to Vedanta, because we get a result. We get benefit for yourself in your personal life and for those around you and for society at large. Religion, spirituality, these are not luxuries. These are essentials. If you do without them, you try to do without them. Somebody wrote an essay, I remember. In America, they gave an essay to school, school children, 14-year-old boys and girls. Um, if you were in charge of the country, what would you do? So the kid, he told me his essay. He had written many things. One thing is, he said, I would uh, remove religion, no need. 14-year-old, no, no idea of life, no idea of suffering. Another gentleman wrote to me that uh, my daughter, who is 13 years old, asked me a question I cannot give reply to. Swamiji, you always say there is suffering in life, and in order to overcome suffering, we need to go beyond suffering, we need to learn all these things. But my daughter said to me, well, there is joy and suffering, you accept the joy. And uh, why not accept the suffering also and go on with life? Seems to be very logical. Swamiji had no reply to that. I said, the, she's a 13-year-old child. You don't have to listen to all that. She has not faced, and let us pray to God that she does not face serious suffering in her life. She has not faced suffering. She has not faced challenges. It's very easy to say, I accept happiness, accept sorrow also, for somebody who has not faced sorrow, has not got a shock in life. So it's not all that easy. And to face life, we need strength. I remember once I met this in our, uh, in our ashram, one young monk, a brahmachari, sitting rather in a little depressed mood. I asked him, what's wrong? What do you want? Oh, my mind is not happy. Well, what do you want in life? I want peace. I said, see, don't seek peace. Swami Vivekananda said, always seek strength. If you are strong, you will get peace. Physically strong, morally strong, intellectually strong, spiritually strong, then you will get peace. If you keep on seeking peace, you will find nothing peaceful anymore. Everywhere you will find disturbance. So strength, this empowerment, it comes from Vedanta. So I Vivekananda said, I have taught only the Upanishads, only Bhagavad Gita. Why? It makes you fearless, it gives you strength. That's why I have taught this. Now, there are many philosophical reasons. There is a lot of philosophical excellency in this, in this Vedanta philosophy. But the real reason is practical benefit. You must get benefit from it day to day. Not only moksha, at the end of life, who knows in which life we will get moksha. But uh, here in this life, today, am I getting benefit? Am I getting peace of mind? Am I getting courage? Uh, am I getting some joy in life? Not dependent on the external world? some joy, from peace from within, then Vedanta is working for me, Bhagavad Gita is working for me. Anyway, and that's the advertisement for the talk. So <laughs> let's go into it. My plan is I will speak about it for these next three days, today, tomorrow, and day after. The plan is this. Today we'll lay the foundation, which is called self-knowledge. And then the empowerment, how to make it practical, how to get, become empowered in this life, uh, to stabilize that knowledge. Many people say, Swamiji, we have understood. Gita, Upanishad, Vedanta, we understand what they're trying to say. But it's not practical. It is not, st in the class, I understand. Listening to YouTube videos, I understand. But afterwards, it's not practical for me. How to make it stable, this knowledge, this wisdom? So stabilizing wisdom, 
There is a term in Bhagavad Gita for that, sthita pragya, stabilized wisdom. How to stabilize our, this wisdom and become empowered in day-to-day -day life, that is tomorrow and day after. So today's discussion will be on um, self-knowledge, which is the foundation. This is the most important thing. We get this and then stabilizing it, manifesting it in day-to-day -day life. Now what I'm going to do is, Sri Krishna's first teaching to Arjuna. It's interesting. Sri, Arjuna never asked, who am I? Am I a Satchidananda? Am I body? Am I nothing? He did not ask this. He had just asked, I'm in terrible trouble. Tell me what to do. Instead of telling Arjuna, should you fight or should you not fight? Instead of telling these things, what did Krishna do? He in straight away, in the Bhagavad Gita, second chapter, when Krishna starts speaking, straight away went into Atma Vidya the knowledge of the self, who am I? Straight away, into highest Advaita Vedanta. And then, all the implications, it will become clear whether you should fight this battle or not. First of all, Jnana Yoga, Atma Vidya, who am I? Am Brahmasmi, that knowledge. Then Sadhana, Karma Yoga, Dhyana Yoga, Bhakti. And then it becomes very clear to Arjuna whether he should fight or not, or with what attitude he should fight. So first and foremost, the foundation is this Atma Vidya, knowledge of the self, who am I? Sri Ramakrishna also used to say, in a very homely way, he used to say that, tie the knowledge of Advaita to the hem of your cloth and then do whatever you like. Hem of your cloth means in India, uh, women would tie the keys of the household to the sari, you know, like this they would tie. So tie this knowledge, what you're going to get, this knowledge, tie it to the hem of your cloth, make it a foundation. Then do whatever you like. Whatever you like, you can meditate, you can be a devotee, you can do great service to society, carry on with your career, take care of your family, or run away and sit in the Himalayan cave also. Whatever you want to do, you can do. But this foundation is very important. Listen very carefully, think about it, ask questions, and then try to stay with it. The method of Vedanta is Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. Listen carefully first. Second, we will have a question answer session every day, today, tomorrow, and day after. Ask questions, uh, whatever comes to your mind. And then afterwards, the homework is to stay with it. Those who are good cooks, they know after finishing, cooking is finished, but you don't take it off the pot immediately. There's something called marinating, marinating. So you keep it, put the lid on, let it stay. Let the spices be absorbed. Like that, stay with this knowledge. Think about it. It's practical. It's about you. It's about our, my own nature. When are you not there? Right now, are you here? You'll say, yes. When you leave this hall, will you be there or not? Yes. When you're driving around, going back to work, going back to your apartment, are you there? What, everything else changes, but you are there for yourself. So you, the, our real nature, the self is always there. What is this self? And Krishna thought it is essential for Arjuna to first of all know, who am I? Am I just this body? Am I just this person? Or something higher and deeper? So that question we will take up. What I will do is, Krishna's teaching from verse number 11 to 25 of second chapter. The first teaching he gives. Verse number 11 to 25. He teaches Arjuna, who am I? Atma Vidya. I will summarize that in five points. And I will, we will try to see that in ourselves today. And stop there these five points. The first thing, again and again, Arjuna is told by Krishna, in the battlefield, we're surrounded by death, so many people are going to die. He says, you do not die. The first point is, Atma, Self, you are Nityam, Nityam, eternal. See, what dies? The body dies. Nobody uh, disputes this. When we say we, death is certain, Krishna himself says, Jatasya hi dhruvo mrityu. For those who are born, death is certain. Dhruvam janma mritasya. So he adds also that birth is certain for those who have died, which means you have not really died. Then what is death? If you say death is certain, we all we will say, yes, we know that. We don't want to think about it, we deny it. <laughs> but we know that death is certain. One psychologist, R.D. Laying, British psychologist in 1950s, 60s or so. Uh, he said, human beings are afraid of three things. Human beings are afraid of three things. 
First, the greatest fear in human life is death. One may say that, Swamiji, I'm not afraid of death. I don't think about it. And psychologist will say, ah, you don't think about it. You're suppressing it. <laughs> so the greatest fear is death. This another fear in human life is uh, other people. The French existentialist Sartre said, hell is other people. What is hell? Narak <laughs> is other people. Other people are hell. And the third great fear in our lives is uh, our own minds. What, what suffering is generated by my own mind, you know, that's what we are afraid of. How will I feel next moment? What will I say? What will I do? How will I react to life? I, I am myself most unpredictable to myself. I cannot trust myself. So these three things we are afraid of. Death, other people, and uh, our own minds. And I was just thinking when I read that, Bhagavad Gita takes care of all three. It will show you that you do not die, you cannot die, you are nityam. First point, nityam, you do not die. Impossible, you cannot die. Second, it will show you that no need to be afraid of other people because other people are not other. Upanishad, ancient times, one sutra it gives us, dvitiyadvai bhayam bhavati, from the other comes fear. When you have othered somebody, some place, some activity, some relationship, you push them apart, then only fear comes. R.D. Lang said it in the 1960s. Taitiri Upanishad said it thousands of years ago. Dvitiyad vai bhayam bhavati, from a second, from a, something different from you comes fear. Vedanta shows you they all are one with you. Not one person is other to you. Ma Sharada, Sharada Devi, her last instruction was, in her life, last instruction was that um, no one is an other to you. Learn to make, she was talking to a lady, my daughter, learn to make everybody your own. The world is your own. No one is an other to you. Do not find faults with others. If you want to find faults, find fault with yourself. If you want peace, uh, my daughter. So there is no other. Vedanta will show you that they are all one with you. Third, Vedanta trains the mind in such a way that it gives you, it no longer you need to be afraid of your mind. Your mind becomes your best friend. Sri Krishna tells Arjuna, later on he will tell, you are your own best friend. You are your own worst enemy. Um, who is the best friend? Who is the worst enemy? When your mind has been spiritualized, trained, when it is saturated by knowledge, who am I? That knowledge is there. When it is trained into deep meditation and control, when it's full of devotion and when it is selfless, that mind is your best friend. And the mind which is uncontrolled, sunk in worldly pursuits all the time, that mind is your worst enemy. It will drag you into suffering to suffering. Revered Maharaj's name is, I was just thinking to the Maharaj, Samachittananda. Now, Chitta means mind. Sama means even, serene. The one who has bliss in a serene mind. Now, one thing struck me. I was just thinking today itself. Chit means consciousness, pure consciousness, Atman. Atma is chit, consciousness. So, the, you could, the name could have been Samachitananda, Samachit. But then, you see, Chit, Atman, consciousness, Brahman is the same, already Sama, already there. Nothing has to be done about it. You are Brahman anyway. Chit. Satchit Ananda is already Sama. But practically, what does one have to do? If you want to get the benefit from that, practically it has to be not only Sama Chit, but Sama Chitta. The name has been given very beautifully. Sama Chit means you are Brahman. So that we already have, you have to realize. But what is to be done in spiritual life? You have to become a Jivan Mukta. Who is Sama Chitta? Jivan Mukta is Sama Chitta. Who is Sama Chitta? Stabilized wisdom. The one who gets supreme empowerment. See, this is how the, this knowledge becomes practical in our life. Otherwise, from an Advaitic perspective, everybody is Brahman, equally Brahman. Samachit already present, but Samachitta, that is the job of sadhana, our spiritual life, that is the goal. That is what Sthita Pragya means, but that will take up tomorrow and day after. Today, you cannot die. 
the first thing that Krishna tells Arjuna, you cannot die. He says, just as you, um, in this very body, you go from childhood to youth to middle age to old age, kaumaram yovanam jara. Similarly, he says, you go from one body to another, dehantara prapti, dhiras tatra namuhyati, the wise one is not shaken thereby. The greatest fear, the most terrible thing we are going to experience in life it, is death. And Krishna says there is no need to be shaken by it. We have undergone this experience thousands of times. We are all master, past master, PhD in dying. <laughs> how many times, in whatever, how many lives we have gone through. It's a transition in the body. Just as we have gone from youth to middle age to old age, body has changed so much. Similarly, this body will also change. A new body will come along. This is a fundamental belief, not only in Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, all the Indic religions, multiple lifetimes from body to body. And other religions also. See, one common thing in religion, I'll tell you. Every religion has this one thing in common. Uh, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Zoroastrianism, all the Indian religions, they all have one thing in common. That... Physical death is not the end. If physical death is the end, you cannot have religion. And no religion is possible. So physical death is not the end. Another example Krishna gives here is the example of um, clothes. Vasam si jirnani. As you wear clothes, after some time the clothes become soiled. What do you do? You take it off and put it in a laundry basket and you put on fresh clothes. Similarly, at one time, this body will become unusable. Whether through disease or damage or old, sheer old age. And you, the sentient being, the jiva, the person, you move on from this body. Just like you throw it into laundry basket. It's called Yamaraj laundry bas basket and you throw it into that, and you get a new issue. Fresh suit of clothes you put on, fresh body. As easy as that, Krishna assures us. No, no, where will I get this fresh suit of clothes? Krishna says, don't worry. Uh, the uh, the uh, Amazon Prime delivery will be there for you. It will come for you. I will provide. I will provide for you. God says, God will provide for us. Don't worry about it. Uh, there's a system for that, and you will get a further uh, set of experiences in new life. So, the first thing again and again Krishna tells Arjuna in the middle of the battlefield where death is going to be all around him, you will not die, nor any of these. Their bodies will die. Uh, death is inevitable, but you need not be, uh, you need not be shaken because of physical death. How are we to understand this? Note something. Right now, we have two kinds of experiences. One is a physical experience. You are there, that physical body, everybody can see. It's a public physical body, it's sitting in the chair. It's a biological machine. That's the body. But that's not our only experience, actual experience, not, not something to be believed in because religion tells us. There is another experience that we all have right now. What is that experience? Our inner, our inner first person experience. Each of us, we are thinking, we are seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, remembering, likes, dislikes, all have feelings. I am feeling good, I am not feeling good, I am bored, I am excited. We are, we are awake, sometimes you fall asleep, sometimes we dream, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, all these experiences which are going on in this body. Notice one thing about it. They are all first person experiences which you and I, we are experiencing directly. Physically they cannot be noted. Let me repeat that. No doctor, no scientist can capture a thought, an emotion. Why not? Because it's not a physical thing like this. But it is there. See, this is an interesting thing. Here is something we all have experience of. We all have this data internally. Are you not thinking? Are you not feeling? Are you not uh, enjoying or suffering? Are you not awake, dreaming, deep sleep? Hmm? All of these things are common to all of us. 
undeniable, everybody experiences. This is what is called being a sentient being, living being. And yet, science can't explain it. The limit of science is the limit of physical matter. What is the last thing that science can point out in this body? Electrical activity in the uh, brain and the nervous system. Beyond that, a thought, an emotion, an idea, a desire, where is it? What neuroscientists have found is a strong correlation between the activities of the brain which they can observe through um, the miracles of modern medical imaging technology and the reported experiences from the subject. What you say, I am feeling a pain, I am remembering something, and they will see there is some movement in the, uh, some kind of electrical activity in the brain cells. That correlation they have found, that much only. So this inner life which we all have, this is part of what in Vedanta is called subtle body, sukshma sharira, subtle body. What is the physical body? This one. What is the subtle body? All of us internally are feeling this. Now, why am I saying this? What Krishna wants to point out is, what is death? Nobody will doubt. Death is clinically accepted by everybody, disputed by none. Death of the physical body. Now my question is, when the physical body dies, why do you think that person is dead? That inner person which you are there, everybody is there. How do you know that person is dead? When the physical body is dead. Oh, we can't, that person is not talking, moving. Of course, cannot talk or move or say anything because the body is dead. The machine through which that person was interacting with the world, that machine has broken down. How do you know that person is dead? Now, answer, most of pe people will say that, yeah, it's pretty obvious because somewhere inside we have taken it for granted, the uh, basic idea uh, that a materialistic worldview gives us. That somehow I, the person, this conscious person, this sentient person, I am somehow being generated by this body. Brain is dead, how will the person be alive? Uh, no. To, uh, to establish that, you have to show how brain is generating that person. If you can show that, then there is no doubt, if the brain is gone, person is also gone. But have we been able to show that? Not at all. In fact, that's the well-known big question in consciousness studies today, called the hard problem of consciousness. How a physical thing, like the brain, oh, sorry. Vedanta is thirsty work. How a physical thing like the brain can generate subjective first-person experiences. So the hard problem of consciousness, if you Google it, you'll find this is the most important question in science today. And there is no answer to it. That is driving some thinkers, philosophers of mind, some scientists, not all, some scientists, some neuroscientists, some philosophers of, uh, uh, of, philosophers of mind, to a new idea that consciousness, mind, may be independent of brain. That it uses the brain, but even when the brain is dead, that mind, that person is not dead. This is the idea of subtle body, sukshma sharira. What I want to impress upon all of us is that it's not a theory. We are all experiencing it now. Subtle body, thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, who is not experiencing? Everybody is experiencing. And something everybody is experiencing, science has no explanation for. How, what an interesting thing. All right, so I'll leave it at that. Now, according to the Gita or Upanishads, in fact, in most of the religious uh, ideas of the human personality, even this uh, subtle body, that's not our real nature. Notice the name, body, subtle body, sukshma sharira. Just as you are not the physical body, you are also not the subtle body. Subtle body, it does not die at the death of the physical body. It goes on to other experiences and possibly other future bodies. But that's also not you. That's also subject to change. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, it changes. 
throughout our uh, lifetime itself, from childhood to middle age to old age, how much it changes. In one day, waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, how much the internal experiences change. Somebody said that, uh, what an amazing thing. Every day when we fall asleep, we enter into a controlled hallucination, co a controlled coma, <laughs> every day, every night. And when we wake up, one neuroscientist in England, uh, Dr. Anil said, he said, our waking experience is a controlled hallucination. Controlled hallucination. It is being, information is coming from the external world, but then the brain is generating our experience of this world. And nobody doubts it. It's a just direct statement of medical fact. Uh, what we are experiencing right now is a, like a virtual reality generated by the most powerful computer in the world, which is our, phys our brain. So we are inhabiting this virtual reality. Like Matrix movie, like this Matrix movie, we're living in it now, even more than that movie. So um, Sri Krishna says that the physical body is not, the, is not you. It has a beginning and end. And there are many physical bodies we have gone through. Even the subtle body is not you. That also keeps changing. Beyond the physical body, beyond the subtle body, is the real Atman, is the real you, the experiencer of this physical body, experiencer of this subtle body, and that is beyond death. Physical body, born, dies. Born, ages, and dies. So Swami put it very uh, humorously. He said, what is uh, life? It's a dash from the womb to the tomb. <laughs> you know, in the, when the, somebody's buried, they will put a, a date of birth, date of, date of death, and one dash. So <laughs> dash from the womb to the tomb. That is the physical body. What, is, what about the subtle body? It goes through many lifetimes. So many lifetimes, from lifetime to lifetime, our idea is that Jivatma travels from lifetime to lifetime. That also is, so in that sense, we, we, none of us die. But Krishna is not trying to say that. That's also not a solution to the problem. Instead of one death, you are experiencing many deaths. Mrityu samrityu gachati, mrityu apnoti. Upanishad says one goes from death to death, the one who does not realize who uh, one is. One who does not get self-knowledge, one goes from death to death. Beyond the subtle body is our real nature. What is that real nature? The Atman or Chit, consciousness, or Sat, being, pure existence, or Ananda, bliss. This is the formulation. One good way of locating it to understand what is being meant is to look into our own experiences. Notice one thing. Common to all our experiences is consciousness. So whatever we are experiencing, whether you are seeing something, uh, hearing, smelling, tasting, some, you are there, you are there. Um, so notice this. Now you are seeing a yellow, uh, this orange cloth. Cloth is there. You are, are you there? You'll say yes. Now look at these beautiful flowers. Cloth has changed, flowers have come. But are you there? Yes. Then you close your eyes. Now you cannot see anything. But are you there? I can't see you. You have to tell me whether you are there or not. Yes, I am there. <coughs> you can open your eyes. Now, suppose you are not seeing anything. When you see something, you are there. When you are not seeing something, you are there. Suppose you stop hearing. Will you still be there? Yes. You will not hear my beautiful speech, but you are still there. Suppose you do not hear, smell, taste, touch. No sensory input. Do I still exist? Do you still exist? Or you will not, you will stop to exist, stop existing. No, on principle, it, you will not disappear. Just as when you see this, you exist. Suppose you close your eyes and you do not see it, you still exist. This may or may not exist, may have gone away, but you still exist. Similarly, if you shut out all sensory inputs, you will still continue to exist. Even more deeply, if you shut out all thoughts, external senses shut down. All thoughts, emotions, ideas, if you shut it down, will you still exist? 
And in principle, it seems to be that, yes, I will continue to exist. Yes, I'm not thinking anymore. I'm not feeling anymore. I'm not even saying I anymore, but I still exist. In an inexpressed form, in an unmanifest form, I still exist. Reverse it. Reverse it. What, what do I mean by reverse it? You are there, and you see this yellow cloud. You are able to see it. Suppose you, that consciousness, were not there. Would you be able to see this yellow cloth? If you, um, if you closed your eyes, and uh, would you still be able to hear anything? No. No experience in life is possible if you, the consciousness, is not there. But without the experienced objects in life, you, the consciousness, we can still exist. Let me repeat that, this conclusion. As long as you exist, everything else you can keep on experiencing. If you shut down the experiences, suppose you don't see. Somebody is blind, they don't see. But does it mean that they don't exist? No, 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 they exist. But that existence, that consciousness, if that disappears, then no experience is possible. Is that correct or not? Can you say that, do you feel that confidently? If I am not there, that consciousness, that Chaitanya, that Chit, no experience will be possible. The universe will go dark for me. That consciousness, which experiences the mind, and through the mind experiences the body, through the body and the senses experiences the world, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, that consciousness is Atman, is Atma. This is what Krishna is pointing, to, pointing out to Arjuna. Because of that, imagine that as a light. In the Upanishads, Kato Upanishad, Mundaka Upanishad, it is said, that shining, everything here uh, shines after it. By its light, everything here is lit up. In Sanskrit, tameva bhantam anubhati sarvam, tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati. That shining, everything here is lit up. By its light, everything here shines. You shining, everything in your life is lit up. By your light, by your light means by you the light. Everything is uh, lit up. You get the experience of life, of, of life itself. Without you, the light. Suppose somehow it was possible that switch off. You don't exist anymore. Then nothing else will be revealed to you. At least from your perspective, the universe will go dark. So this consciousness which you are, which we are, is essential to experience life. Happiness of life, misery of life, enjoyment, suffering, understanding, remembering, forgetting, all of it depends on consciousness. Chaitanya. So this is the Atman. This is the uh, self which Krishna is pointing out. And it's pointing out it is Nityam. He uses other word. Number of times he tells Arjuna, you are Nityam. You are not born, body is born. You do not age, body ages. You do not die, body dies. The mind, you are not the one who is depressed or happy. Mind is sometimes depressed, sometimes happy. You are not the one who is ignorant or knowledgeable. It's mind which is ignorant and can become knowledgeable. You are not the one who, has, who remembers or has memory failure. It is mind which has got that. You are the constant light behind all of that. That which lights up at least what we call life itself. It gives us the feeling of life. It is, essential, it is the core element of living, of life. Christoph Koch, who is a leading uh, neuroscientist, he recently wrote a book just two, three years ago. And he called it, about consciousness, he called it the feeling of life itself. What is consciousness? The feeling of life itself. Which feeling? All feelings. Which sensation is consciousness? All sensation. Which experience is consciousness? All experiences. But without consciousness, no experience, no sensation, no feeling, nothing, no life. That is nityam. Another word he uses, abhyaya. Not decreasing, not subject to decay. See, body dies, but mind also, it goes through ups and downs. Sometimes depressed, sometimes happy, sometimes sleepy, one cup of coffee, very alert. Ups and downs, mind will go through. But Atman does not go through. You, the consciousness, you do not go through ups and downs. No birth, aging, death for you. No ups and downs for you. You are the constant witness, illuminer of all these states of, states of body and mind. Nityam. Another word he uses, Abhyaya. 
it cannot be killed. Krishna goes into great lengths that it cannot be cut, it cannot be drowned, it cannot be um, uh, you know, suffocated, it cannot be dried out. So all the five elements cannot destroy you, the consciousness. Then the next one he asks, he teaches Arjuna. All right, so what or where is this consciousness? Where is it? That question comes. And he uses a word, two words he uses. No, not two, multiple words. Aprameya, abhyakta, achintya. All of them pointing it out to us exactly what, what is he talking about? What is this consciousness? Body I know. Yes. Mind also I understand. Thoughts, feelings, emotions I understand. But what is this pure consciousness is pointing out? Atman. He is using these words. Abhyakta, achintya, aprameya. What does it mean? So this is the second point I am putting before uh, you as uh, sum summarizing Krishna's teachings. Use one word, very technical word, aprameya, aprameya. What does that mean? Not an object of knowledge. What do you mean not an object of knowledge? Ever the subject of knowledge, never the object of knowledge. It is helping us to locate, understand, locate quote unquote, what we are. Because when you say, Body, everybody is clear, this one. When you say mind, we are also clear, internally we feel it, our own minds. But Atma, we, we are not very clear. We only have a vague understanding. So Krishna is become making it very precise. Aprameya. See, first of all, Abhyakta. Abhyakta, not manifest. This world is manifest. You can see it, you can hear it, you can smell it, taste it, touch it. The mind is also manifest. You feel it. Thoughts, emotions, memories, good feeling, bad feeling, it's all there. This is called vyakta, manifest. But you, the subject, I, the subject, am abhyakta, unmanifest. He says, it is not an object of any of our senses. The Atman, you can, the body is an object of all the senses. You can see the body, touch the body, smell, taste, eh? hear the rumblings in the tummy. All senses can objectify the body. But the Atman is not objectified by any of the senses. It is not an object of any sense. It is the pure subject. There is a very nice story, um, which I am very fond of, which points out this thing. It is called the Tenth Man story. I have told many times, many of you, how many of you have heard it, the Tenth Man story? Okay, about three-fourths of the audience, have, they have heard it. But it's always worth repeating. I'll give you a short version of it. It's to understand what? This aprameya. The tenth man story says ten friends went on a journey and they uh, crossed a river and then, um, then they thought, have everybody, did everybody cross or did somebody drown? And then one of them counted, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh my God, the tenth person has drowned. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Tenth person is drowned. Everybody counted, they found only nine. They found nine people out there. They started crying. And then somebody was passing by, asked, why are you crying, my friends? Well, because of our friend, the tenth man is drowned. How do you know that the tenth man is drowned? Well, because we counted, we found only nine people. And this man must have understood what is going on. He said, don't worry, the tenth person is there. See, Guru comes, Gita comes and tells us, God exists, Brahman exists, Atman exists. We don't know where, we don't understand, but calm down, it's all right. It's all right. Similarly, he said, the tenth man is there, don't cry. I will, where? I will show you, I will show you. Count. They said, we have already counted, sir. Well, count again, humor me, I will show you. And th this man counted, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I told you nine. And the passerby, he took the hand and turned it around, ten. Dashamastvamasi, you are the tenth. <coughs> and this man was delighted. Oh, I see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, tenth man has been found. And the other said, let me try, let me try. And they all tried. They all found the tenth man. They are all very happy. Now, what is the mistake that this man who was counting, what mistake was he doing? Why was he not able to find the tenth man? And we know what mistake he was doing. Immediately we will say he was not counting himself. Okay. Why was he not counting himself? 
Why was he not come? More difficult question, but more subtle question. Because where did he expect to find the tenth man? Outside. Why did he expect to find the tenth man outside? Because other nine people were outside. He has got very good reason. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine are all out there. And therefore the tenth man also has to be out there. But the tenth man is not like the other nine. The tenth man is not an object. See, he has a good reason. Whatever he knows was an object, all nine. And he thought the tenth man should also be like that. But nobody's there and therefore dead. The tenth man is not an object like that. The tenth man is the counter himself. We understand this. But exactly like that, the same mistake we are doing when we try to understand who am I? Okay, here is the body and I'm being told I'm not the body. Here is the mind thoughts, feelings, emotions, personality, and I'm being told I'm not even the mind. Then who am I? Where am I? Doesn't seem to be anybody there. So maybe it's nothing is there. Blank. Tenth person is dead. But you, the consciousness who is counting all this, to you to whom the body is appearing, thoughts, feelings, emotions are appearing and disappearing also, you to whom even the blankness of deep sleep is appearing, that you is the Atman, but it is not an object. It is not an object. Once we understand this, once we hear these teachings, our tendency will be like that counter to find the Atman. When I suddenly realize, oh, I am the Atma, very good. It's a nice thing. Body I have seen, mind I have seen. Now Gita Krishna is telling me I am something called Atma. Let me see that. Nothing. You can't find it. You can't find it because it's, it's very well hidden. It's not an object. You know that funny story of uh, the man who went on a long train journey and long time ago. In those days, people had to carry cash. So he was carrying cash, but he was worried about thieves on the train. So, um, and this one suspicious looking character was sitting in front of him, who was actually a thief. And that thief thought, this man is got a lot of cash, he would take it out and count it nicely and then put it away somewhere. When he goes to sleep, I will steal it. But when that man went to sleep, the thief started searching here and there, could not find anything. Nicely under the bed, in the um, um, wallet of the man, in the luggage of the man, nowhere, he could not find it. He got very puzzled. Next day in the morning, again that man is counting the money. Now this thief got exasperated. When it was time for the man to get down, the thief finally confessed. That, sir, I am very sorry, but actually I am a thief. And I tried to steal your money, but I could not find your money. I am, my curiosity is driving me wild. Where did you hide the money? And the man said, under your pillow. <laughs> so, <laughs> all our money is hidden under our own pillow. And we are trying to grasp it. Like, the moment, where is the Atman? Where is Brahman? Where is God? Swami Vivekananda says, this God, what we call God, is this very Atman seen from the outside. Seen in reality, it is you, your higher nature. But when we do not know that, and yet we have an intuition, there is some infinite, all-powerful reality, it becomes God for us. So you worship from the outside as God, and knowledge from the inside as I am that. Same thing, same religion. What we are doing here and what is going on in the temple, this side and that side of the coin. Same thing. So, you are the subject. Eternal subject, never an object. Always remember the tenth man story. In fact, Vidyaranya Swami, in his Panchadashi, he has used this tenth man story to show the whole spiritual journey. Seven stages, he says. First, Ajnana, ignorance. Ignorance, I don't know about the tenth man. Then he says, Avarana. Avarana means veil. The tenth man, I am not experiencing the tenth man. The one who is counting. If you say, are you experiencing the tenth man? You will say that that person is experiencing. He is the tenth man. But he will say, no, I don't know. I am not experiencing the tenth man. I am counting. I can't find. So Avarana, veil. First is Ajnana. I don't know about the Atma. I don't know about my real nature. Second is, my real nature I am not experiencing. See, what a beautiful story. 
you who understand everything, you will say he was always experiencing the 10th man because he was himself the 10th man. Vedanta Krishna is telling us, you are always, all of us are experiencing the Atman because we are the Atman, we are already experiencing. But veil, we will say, no, I don't experience. Then third stage, vikshepa, trouble, trouble, sorrow, suffering, uh, old age, disease, death, um, my beloved ones are being taken away from me and so on and so forth. Uh, death, uh, suffering, vikshepa, that is the third problem. And then comes paroksha jnana. Paroksha jnana means indirect knowledge. You go to PGP hall and then hear, hear a talk that you are the Atma, you read Krishna, Krishna is telling you you are the Atma. Indirect knowledge. I have read the book, I have got some information, that much. Then comes Aparoksha Jnana. Aparoksha Jnana means direct knowledge. When that man said, you are the tenth, Dashamastvamasi, suddenly he realized, oh, I am the tenth. Before that indirect knowledge was, tenth man is still alive. Now is you are the tenth. And then comes the sixth stage, which is uh, Dukkha Nivritti. All sorrows go away. Oh, the tenth man is not dead. My sorrow has gone. Ananda Prapti, seventh stage, happiness. Oh, what joy, we have found the tenth man. Similarly, when we get the Aparoksha Jnana, Aham Brahmasmi, I realize suddenly, I am that, I always was that. Then Dukkha Nivritti, all suffering and sorrow goes away. Because I realize I cannot die. I am eternal. I am beyond all sorrow and suffering. The whole universe is one with me. I am limitless existence, consciousness, bliss. All sorrow and suffering goes away and attainment of bliss is there, Ananda Prapti. So seven stages of spiritual life you can understand through tenth man story. What are the seven stages? Ajnana, ignorance. Avarana, veiling, covering up. Then Vikshepa, so suffering. Then Paroksha Jnana, indirect knowledge. You get it from a lecture, a book, study and think about it. Then Aparoksha Jnana, direct knowledge. I am the tenth. Aham Brahmasmi. Then Dukkha Nivritti, sorrow is removed. Ananda Prapti, seventh stage, bliss, attainment of bliss. Seven stages. All of this Krishna shows by Aprameya. You, the Atman, you, the pure consciousness, you are like the tenth man. You are not an object. You cannot point to it. You are the one who is doing the pointing. You cannot see it. You are the one who is doing the seeing. Uh, the Atman, the pure consciousness, that is what you are. Uh, unless we know this, we will always be trying to grasp it and failing to grasp it. And then in frustration, we will say, no, it is not true. Nothing like that is there. All right. The great... Scottish philosopher, David Hume, he said, when I look within myself, I see a stream of thoughts and emotions and perceptions. I see no sign of what is called the self. And he stopped there. So the self, there cannot be anything such as the self. Now Krishna will say, Professor Hume, my dear David, the self is not there, you did not find it because you were looking like the tenth man, you were searching, where is that self? Thoughts, feelings, emotions, no self. So no self, you, have, you did not find it because it's not an object to be found. You are the self, aprameya. You are the one who was counting. You were looking in the wrong place. It's under your pillow, <laughs> not in the pillow of the <laughs> outside, uh, somewhere outside. So, aprameya, so that's the second thing to understand. The rest is much easier. Third thing that Krishna teaches Arjuna, ekaha, one. One. How many selves are there? How many atmas? One. He does not do so in the second chapter. Thirteen chapter he makes a clear statement. Kshetragyam chap imam vidhi sarva kshetreshu bharata. In all these beings, there is one consciousness. It does not seem to be so. Many bodies are there. Many minds are there, no doubt. Because of many bodies, many minds, many personalities. We are all different personalities. We are different persons. However, we are one as consciousness. Why so? I will not go into the argument. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about this. Sankhya philosophy says there are many consciousnesses. Advaita says there is one consciousness. As bodies we are many. As persons we are many. But as consciousness, Chaitanya, pure consciousness, we are one. 
That means at our deepest level, we are one existence, one consciousness. We are one being. We are all one at the deepest level. You see that fear that Professor Lang pointed out? Fear of other persons. Or that French philosopher said, other, uh, hell is other persons. But there is no other person. These persons may be all different, but within the person, the deepest level, we are all one reality. So, ekaha. Then the fourth term which we learn about ourselves, sarvagataha. Sarvagata, Krishna says to Arjuna in this few verses, all pervasive, all pervasive. Important thing to learn. We instinctively feel, I may be body, mind, atma, I don't mind, but I'm sure I'm here only, this much only. This is outside me. But inside and outside are body. Body. As consciousness, as awareness, the body is in your awareness, the chair is also in your awareness, all these people are in your awareness, the hall is in your awareness, even Singapore and what's outside Singapore, as known and unknown, is in your awareness, as the background, it is there in your awareness. Whole universe is in your awareness. It's not that awareness is in the universe. As long as we think, after listening to all this Vedanta, if we think, I am a body, in this body is a mind, in the mind is consciousness or atma, you will never get liberation. It's the other way around. You are the Atman, you are consciousness. In that appears body-mind. In one body-mind you are reflected, I am Sarvapriyananda here, I am somebody else there, I the same consciousness in all thousands and millions of beings. So Sarvagataha, all pervasive. I am reminded of, I have told this number of times, I really loved it. One sadhu in uh, Haridwar, this Vedanta class is going on and the teacher is saying, I am all pervasive consciousness. From the back of the hall, I will tell you original was in Hindi, some of you may understand, some may not understand. From the back of the hall, somebody said, Main yaha, aap waha, sarvagata kaise hua? Yeah. I am here, you are there sir. How can I be all pervasive? I am not, I am here, I am not even there. Main yaha ho, waha bhi nahi ho. In this one hall itself, I am not there. How can I be all pervading? And then the teacher, was Swami, who replied very beautifully, See, even here and there, are they not both appearing in you, the consciousness? Are you not aware of this is close, that is far? Far and close are both in consciousness. They are not in the body, but body, other body, and all of these distance, all of this is appearing in consciousness. Take a stand not as the body, take a stand as consciousness, you will suddenly see the whole universe is appearing in you as the known and the unknown. One question here might be, Swami, whole universe, that's a big claim. This hall I can see. What is beyond the hall also I cannot see. Let alone Pacific Ocean and the whole world and the universe. How can you say whole universe is in, uh, appearing in me, the consciousness? I am conscious only of little bit. But you are conscious of this little bit as the known. You see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it, think about it. But you are also conscious of the external world as a vast unknown presence, background. To tell you what I mean, think of your dreams. In your dream you are experiencing a world. And that part of, you are experiencing part of that world. And you have a feeling, outside this room there is another whole world is there. In your dream also you feel that. But when you wake up, in your dream also you feel, I am sitting here and that person is sitting there. But when you wake up, here and there, seen and unseen, all of it will be what? Your mind, your dreaming mind. Mind itself generated everything. Similarly, according to Vedanta, you the Atman, you the one consciousness, in you the entire universe is appearing. Yes, through that body, you are able to see, hear, smell that part of it. Think. With that mind, you are able to think of a part of it and the rest remains unknown. Whatever you know, it keeps changing, like the focus of a flashlight. But the rest remains unknown and yet in you the one consciousness. This example, um, I'm just worried about the time. We'll, I'll just, one or two points I will make and stop. 
but this example I've given a number of times, what, what uh, thinking about? Our senior most member in the Vedanta Society in New York is Bill Conrad. He's 99 years old this month. Uh, he, so he's a physicist. He said, Swami, it is not true that the world is in consciousness. If consciousness is in the world. The world exists. Then you and I as conscious beings, we come and experience the world. Common sense idea. I will prove it to you, he said. How? Let us put one camera in this room. And then you and I, conscious beings, we will go out of the room. When we come back into the room, I will show you the picture in the camera. Room was there as such. No conscious being was there. So room exists without consciousness. It's not that because you are seeing only room is there. I said to him, Bill, in your consciousness, you thought of this experiment. In your consciousness, you put a camera. In your consciousness, you said, Swami, let us go out of the room. You, in your consciousness, we went out of the room. In your consciousness, we came back into the room. In your consciousness, we opened the camera and saw the picture of the empty room. Where did you step outside your consciousness? At which point? Where can you step out of the consciousness? Can you at all do that? No, you cannot do it. According to Vedanta, even deep sleep, which seems to be unconscious, is also a state of blankness in consciousness. So, sarva gataha, all pervading consciousness. Better way of understanding is, not that all is there and somehow consciousness is like a gas going all over the universe. No, all is in consciousness. In that sense, consciousness pervades. Last point I'll make and then stop. It's the most difficult one. I will not try to defend it. It will take 30, 40 minutes to talk about it. In, uh, but I'll just put it there. Krishna says in the 16th verse of sec second chapter, Nasato vidyate bhavo, na bhavo vidyate sadaha. There he says, that which is unreal never comes into existence, although you see it. And that which is real never goes out of existence, although you don't see it. What is real? You, the consciousness. You never see yourself. And what is unreal? The entire universe which is you are seeing in consciousness. There is a Buddhist saying, very beautiful, Tibetan Buddhist saying. This entire universe, samsara, is like a magical display in consciousness. When you are ignorant, when you become enlightened, this samsara itself will be the magical display of nirvana in consciousness. But you are the same consciousness. It has to be. Think about it. The one who is in ignorance, in bondage, in samsara, that one only will get enlightenment and freedom. You will be the same one. If somebody else gets freedom, what is it to me? I will get freedom. I who? Who is this I will get freedom? The I, the, en the enlightened one, I am the same one who was seeing samsara in my ignorance. I am the same one who will see nirvana, moksha in my freedom or enlightenment. Same consciousness. That's why Shankaracharya sings, na dharmo, na charto, na kamo, na moksha, chidananda rupa, shivoham, shivoham. I am of the nature of pure consciousness. I am Shiva, I am Shiva. So, the last point which I want to make is, you, the Atman, the consciousness, you are real, the world is an appearance. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Mithya, Atma Satyam, you Satyam, and the entirety of what you see in yourself as consciousness, body, mind, world, is an appearance, like a magic show, an appearance in consciousness. Five points about you, about Atma, Krishna has made. What are the five points? You are eternal, immortal, undying. You cannot die. Don't be afraid. Nityam. He uses many words. Nitya, Abhyakta, uh, uh, Abhyaya, Nitya, Abhyaya, Shashvata, Purana. He says many words he uses. Nitya, one word let us take. You are Nitya, eternal. Second, you are uh, Aprameya, not an object. You are not an object. You are ever the subject. You are the light which illumines everything. That is why the beautiful, that lamp and was lit. If you heard the chanting, Deepa Jyoti, light of the lamp, is Atma Jyoti, is Brahma Jyoti. It, it symbolizes you, the consciousness. The second point, Aprameya. What does it mean? You are pure consciousness, ever the subject, never an object. Just because you cannot see it does not mean you don't exist. You are the one who is seeing. So, Aprameya. Third one, 
is that you are uh, ekaha, cunning thing, that we are all one consciousness, there is no other. Fourth, sarvagata, all pervading. It's not that I am the body, in that body some little consciousness is there. I am not a body with consciousness. I am a consciousness in which mind, body and universe are appearing and disappearing. And finally, you are the reality. Satya, Atma Satya or Brahma Satya, Jagat Mithya, world is an appearance. Five, Nitya, Aprameya, Ekaha, Sarvagata, Satya. Immortal, eternal and immortal, not an object, always the subject, Aprameya. Then one, one, you are one. Then third, a fourth one, all pervasive. Last one, you are the reality, the world, the universe is an appearance. How strange it is. We are constantly there in all our experiences. The world is changing all the time. Nobody doubts this. And what is our feeling? I am, the world is, will always be there. I am the one who is born and I will go away, I will die. World will continue. That's my feeling. But the fact is that you are always there in all the experience. The changing world, we think it is, it is unchanging, it will always be there. You, the unchanging, we feel that I am born, I will die. This is the nature of ignorance. So this is what Sri Krishna has taught us, the five characteristics, essential characteristics of the Atman. This is self-knowledge. What thinking about, hearing about, thinking about, meditating upon it. And like the tenth man, remember, like the tenth man, it's already there. We are not getting it. The next phase we will move into is a short question-answer phase. How are we doing for time? Thank you very much, Pujya Swamiji, for enlightening yeah, you, us. You can clap. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pujya Swamiji, for enlightening us about the ultimate Atma Vidya and lucidly explaining to us about consciousness, Atman, in five characteristics. With this foundation, we look forward to listening to you about stabilizing wisdom, Sthita Pragna, and manifesting it in the following days. Swamiji will now take a few questions from the audience. There are three mics in each of the aisles. Please queue up behind them to ask your questions. Before we begin the Q&A session, there are a few announcements. IGF talks by Swamiji will continue tomorrow and on Saturday evening at 7 p.m. here at the same venue. On Saturday morning, Swamiji will address the youth forum in this very hall. For this purpose, youth are defined as persons of the age 35 or below. Registration. <laughs> Registration is solicited for this. Please visit Geeta Jayanti website to complete the registration process. On Sunday, 30th July, between 7 a.m. and 1 p.m., Gita Havan will be performed at the first level along with Sampurna Parayanam, that is chanting of all the verses of the Bhagavad Gita. Ahuti for each shloka will be offered in the Havan Kunds. Devotees may offer the Ahuti by themselves. Materials for Ahuti will be provided. Swamiji will also bless us with his presence at the Havan and will deliver a short lecture thereafter. The latest initiative of Gita Jayanti, Likhita Gita Samarpanam, is continuing this year also. Devotees may write the verses of the Bhagavad Gita along with Dhyana Shlokas and Gita Mahatmyam Shlokas in their own handwriting in a language of their choice. These handwritten books will be placed in the altar on Mokshada Ekadashi Parayanam, that is on Saturday, 23rd December, 2023. The books blessed by Gita Charya Shri Krishna and energized by the vibrations of mass Gita chanting may be collected back after the puja. 
It isn't too late to start writing even now. Writing just five shlokas, yes, mere 10 lines or so every day from tomorrow will comfortably take you to completion before the Mokshada Ekadashi Parayanam Day. In the IGF booklet, which has been distributed to all of you, and you may collect it from the counter if you haven't received your copy yet, you will find more details regarding Likhita Gita Samarpanam, that is, in the first few pages. And in the end, you also find the link to uh, register and submit your sankalpa to participate in this um, Likhita Gita Samarpanam. Even if you are overseas, that is not in Singapore, you may still participate. You may submit your sankalpa online and you may place the handwritten Gita in the place of worship in your home and chant the entire Gita, thus receiving the blessings of Gita Charya. We have a super senior citizen in Chennai who is aged about 91 years, who has taken this sankalpa and who has decided to write down the verses of the Gita despite his physical constraints. He should surely serve as a great source of inspiration for all of us to do this. Let us all take this divine opportunity to participate in this yajna of Likhita Gita Samarpanam. Donations to Gita Jayanti are welcome. A donation box is kept in the foyer. Donations may be made in cash or through pay now. The QR code for donations is pasted on the box. They are displayed in the dining hall and are also indicated in the IGF booklets distributed. So on the IGF booklet, you have certain QR codes printed uh, on, the, on the back. So you have a QR code to sign up as a Gita Jayanti volunteer, to sign up for more information on Gita Jayanti events, and to contribute towards Gita Jayanti. For the benefit of those who are not familiar with the scanning process, a special counter has been set up outside this hall for assistance. Sattvic prasadam will be served at the end of today's session in the dining hall below. Based on a few queries received, kindly note that specific donations may be made towards prasadam being served after the events every day. It could cover the daily costs partially or totally. Those who want to donate may please contact Snehikant Gupta ji or any other team members for donating towards prasadam. Swamiji will now take a few questions from the audience. Please use the microphones on the aisle and queue up before them to ask your questions in turn. A humble request, please only state your name and no further introduction is needed. Please keep your questions simple and straight. Let them be like Arjuna's arrows, swift, pointed, and focused, since we've all gathered here only to listen to Swamiji. Okay, so I see, um, all right, now don't, that's it, we'll, we'll, we're going to cut it off right there, no more questions, there are one, two, three, four people here, five, six, seven people, that's it, so don't uh, extend the line, because we won't be able to take so many questions this evening. Let's start here, uh, tell us your name and ask the question. My name is Srijit. Thank you for coming again to Singapore. I have been here uh, listening to literally all the words that you spoke last time when you came here. Um, I have only one question. Uh, it's about uh, our essential nature, which is um, uh, existence, consciousness, and bliss. I get the beingness, the existence. I also get consciousness, the awareness, being aware, but I don't get the bliss. Mm. What is it? Yes. So his qu question is very, uh, very pertinent. It's not difficult to understand that I exist. We also saw today, 
that the orange cloth, whether it is there or not there, you are there. Uh, whether you're seeing or not, you are there. Hearing or smelling, tasting or not, you are there. You continue to be there. That existence is not difficult to understand. We exist, nobody doubts it. And this existence is also a conscious existence. I am aware. Not only there, I am aware. It's a shining existence. Nobody doubts that also. We, we feel it. But how is it bliss? How is it ananda? The short answer to your question is this. According to Advaita Vedanta, the unlimited nature of this existence consciousness is ananda. Let me repeat. The unlimited nature of this existence consciousness is ananda. You know that you are. You exist. You know that you are, you are aware. But that this existence is an unlimited existence, this awareness is an unlimited awareness, this is ananda. What does it mean? Normally we don't think our existence is unlimited. I think my existence is limited in space and time and object. What do I mean by that? Where is my existence? Only here, not even there. Yaha, huh? My existence only in this hall, in this chair in Singapore, not across, not unlimited. <coughs> not only that, my existence, I feel sure, is limited in time. I was born on such and such date, and surely on such and such some date I will die. Body, born and die. So my existence is limited in time, beginning and end is there. And my existence is limited by you all, because I exist as only this one. I don't exist as you. You are all separate from me. This is, according to Vedanta, the real source of our sorrow and suffering. If I could find my existence is unlimited, never born, never dying, and my existence is all pervasive, everything in the universe is in me, not separate from me. All beings are me, I alone, they are not apart from me. So, desha kala vastu, space, time and object do not separate me from anybody else. That unlimited existence will be a, the source of fulfillment, that I will always be happy. Upanishad says, Yo vai bhuma tat sukham, nal pe sukham asti. That which is the infinite is joy. There is no joy in the limited. Because we feel limited existence, as you said, I feel I am existing. I feel I am consciousness. But I don't feel that bliss. It's because we feel limited existence consciousness, that's why we don't feel bliss. Look at the five characteristics today. All the characteristics where showing us the unlimited nature of our existence consciousness. One, this uh, nitya, eternal, no beginning, no end. So your existence is not birth and death, is always there. Apramaya, it's not an objective thing out there, it is the pure subject. Then ekaha, it's not a separate existence, we are all one existence, ekaha. Sarvagata, all pervasive. And most of all, Satya, you are the reality, the whole universe is an appearance in you. When this becomes appreciated about our own existence, you will see it is bliss also. That very existence is Sat, Chit, Ananda, existence, consciousness, bliss. Look at the Taittiriya Upanishad, instead of saying Sat, Chit, Ananda, it says Satyam, Jnanam, Anantam. Limitless existence, limitless consciousness is itself Ananda. This is the deep philosophical answer to your question. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I, I get it uh, conceptually, but the thing is, I, 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 am, I, I fully understand staying in awareness. I fully understand in the being, but probably I, I may need something else to... to true. To, it is true. Yeah. However, just one little thing to remember. Any committed non-dualist will tell you one thing, is that remember the tenth man. He is, if he says, I understand I am the tenth man conceptually, but actually am I the tenth man? What is his problem? That paroksha jnana and aparoksha jnana, that, that transition is not happening. He has heard, tenth man is there, I am the tenth man is not becoming clear to him. Uh, you have heard, you have got a basic idea of limitless existence, consciousness, please. Uh, but I am that, that is not yet becoming clear. We have to work on that. It, it, All right. it also, um, sorry. It also seems to me that bliss is something that is unexplainable. 
So we will go into that later again. Uh, there's a lot to be discussed there. Yeah. So we understand there. that this is an eternal topic and every one of us would like to engage in a conversation with Pooja Swamiji, but it is a humble request in the interest of time to please limit your question to just one as we have others waiting to. Thank you. Yes, and there'll be plenty of time tomorrow and day after, I promise. Yes, the gentleman there. Pranam Pooja Swamiji, my name is J.P. Jaiswal. All right, until they get that mic fixed, the lady here. Namaste, Swamiji. My name is Nishtha. My question is um, the last one, Brahman Satyam, Jagat Mithya. I've heard uh, Swami Medanandji as well on this. Um, and as per Mandukya, the Turiya, which is the fourth one, is always there. So I, as a Brahman, um, I, I feel that, you're, that if it's my manifestation, then it is not Mithya. So I'm not if able to If it's a manifestation, it's not Mithya. Yes, you can put it that way also. It's a way of looking at it. Yes. Yeah. Um, the rope and snake. Hmm. Snake is mithya, hmm. but as rope it is satyam. The rope, rope is there. As a separate, uh, limited, ever-changing world, it's mithya, it's an appearance. As Brahman, it is satyam. You are that, that universe which you are experiencing. In a dream, for example, we all say the dream is false, but in one sense it's true because you are the one who's dreaming it all. That you is there. Yes. That cannot be denied. So you are the truth of this manifestation. That is true. We'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. The lady behind, please, tell us your name and ask the question. Hi, I'm Madhurima. Uh, grateful to meet you. Thank you for taking the detour. Um, you mentioned that uh, you are, we are the experiencer of the gross body and the subtle body. And this experiencer, the Atman, is eternal. How can we logically understand that or prove that, that the Atman actually goes on beyond death? And how do we understand that with our limited mind, which ends, has a beginning and an end? Mm. Notice the logic which I gave, that um, um, beyond death, there is nobody who doubts that death is death of physical body. That much is clear. Now, why the death of the physical body is said to be death of the mind also? Why? Forget consciousness for the time being. That is in the background. But even this person, the mind, the you are, I am, I feel myself as a living, thinking being. Why is death of the body equal to death of the mind? Because you will see, once you ask this question, the answer will come that we have somehow, we are convinced that the body, brain is producing the mind. If body is gone, mind is also gone. We think that. But then you actually come to the neuroscience of it, the science of it, the philosophy behind it, you will see hard problem of consciousness. There is no way of proving that brain is producing consciousness. Mm -hmm. There is some link, deep correlation between neuronal activity and conscious experience, but that much. Causality has not been uh, established. That your neuronal activity of the brain is producing you, the person. Mm -hmm. If that was true, then death of the brain is death of the person. But that has not been uh, proved, and that's according to some David Chalmers and others, and I agree. It's impossible to prove that, because it is a category mistake. Philosophically, you're making a mistake between material, objective activity, and subjective experience. Mm -hmm. That's why. But just to kind of uh, pick on that a bit, even if the mind is, uh, even if the mind goes on from uh, birth to birth, um, knowing that the consciousness is separate from the mind, how can we prove that the consciousness also goes on from birth to birth? Oh, I never said consciousness goes on from birth to birth. That's okay. the interesting thing. According to Vedanta, mm -hmm. it is the body which is born and dies once. Then mm -hmm. each body is born and dies. And the subtle body, sukshma sharira, is the one which goes on from birth to birth. Mm -hmm. Consciousness does not go, does not come, does not change, according to Advaita Vedanta. Mm -hmm. And that you see from your own experience. Every change appears to consciousness. But can consciousness itself change? That's the question. Anyway, we'll investigate it more a little later. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Did, is the microphone working? Yeah, it, it's working. Hello? Can, can you speak? Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. OK. I think probably now you can hear me. I'm JP Jaiswal. Pranams to you, Swamiji. Thank you for the. Please speak up a little more. Thank you very much for good, the. Good lucid explanation and uh, every time we we'll read Gita or we we'll go satsang, still there is so much of uh, doubt skips and that's why I have just two questions. 
very straightforward. One is the subtle body. You said the subtle body also never dies. It goes from one body to another body until we get moksha. Now, the, my question is, if from one birth to another birth, when we improve ourselves or we make ourselves a little better and get enlightened, and when we take rebirth, why that knowledge immediately doesn't start from that rebirth? I mean, some cases we have found... All right, let me, let me focus on that particular question because time is short. That much only I'll take. It's a good, really good question. So, idea is that we are going from birth to birth, body is dying, but the subtle body goes on, sukshma sharira. And hopefully we are getting better, lifetime after lifetime, we are learning more, getting better. Now the question might be then, when we come to a particular life, why the knowledge and experiences gained in past life does not become operative immediately in this life? Uh, clearly memory is not there. We do, may, yogis may have memory of past lives, but generally we don't have memory. So all the knowledge gained in the past life is lost to us. Again, we have to start from A, B, C, D, right? Now the interesting thing is, our evolution is not so much a matter of the knowledge gained as the change in the personality, as the change in the character. Notice, memory is a very weak thing. It is lost in this life itself. How much do we remember of the items you ate last, last Thursday? Nothing. Yeah. But and now all the stuff that we learnt in school and college, most of it is gone. Only what you use for your profession, that might be there. So knowledge, memory, that is not an indicator of how we are improving. How we are improving is the change in character. And the change in character comes from samskaras, not necessarily memory. Our tendencies change from lifetime to lifetime. Notice in this life itself, I do something wrong, I have clear memory of it, and I repeat it again. Memory did not make me better. But over time, if I work hard to change my samskaras, my what is called character, then I change. And that is slow and painful. That happens from lifetime to lifetime. We may not remember it, but we have subtly but clearly changed after a lifetime of experience. That is how we progress. Thank you. All right. The gentleman here. Uh, thank you, Samish, for your talk. I want to ask that uh, what is unconsciousness? Is it same as ignorance and is it individual or collective? Unconscious, see this term has become more popular in the last hundred years or so, more than hundred years, big thanks to Freud and his followers. So it talks about a, sta a part of the mind which is not directly accessible to our consciousness, our empirical consciousness, what in Vedanta is called Chidabhasa, reflected consciousness. So those would be the Chitta, the storehouse, our Vasanas, our tendencies from past life. Yes, so that would be the unconscious. Um, yeah. And is it individual or collective? Both. It is individual and collective. So each of us, we have an individual set of our past Vasanas, our tendencies. But there is also a... <laughs> There is also a, a, a collective, what is it? what's going on? <laughs> so there is also a, a collective, uh, uh, you know, like a societal uh, background. I think Carl Jung spoke, spoke about it in great uh, detail. So yeah, they, he called it the archetypes in, in uh, human society. Thank you. The gentleman there. Thank you. Thank you, Swamiji. Namaste. My, na my name is Rishikesh. So, so on the so on the on the one hand, well, so while I can accept what you were talking about at the beginning of the talk, that the time that at the time of crisis, that is the best time and the most important time for Ved to do Vedanta. At the time of crisis, that is also that that is also the time when all of the Vedanta the Vedanta and everything sort of leaves the mind and isn't like it's the furthest from your mind. So I was wondering what advice do you have for dealing with that? Yes, so crisis is the best time for thinking, practicing of Vedanta and that's the time when all Vedanta flies away from the mind. <laughs> it is true, it is true. 
our uh, when when we are under pressure it's interesting to think the real learning comes when we are under pressure when we are under pressure it could be temptation from the world it could be terror fear anxiety and then how do we react so what we react from shows our real learning i remember once one traditional monk in uttarakhand in the himalayas vedanta question answer is going on but somebody asked a question in hindi i'll translate asli shiksha asli shiksha kya hai mahatma ji what is real education people were thinking uh, how is it connected to vedanta but he gave an answer quoting directly from the adhyasa bhashya shankaracharya he said adi shankaracharya said that uh, just like a cow which runs towards a man harita trinapurna the man is standing with a handful of green grass the cow runs towards that man another man comes with a raised upraised danda udyata kara purusha with a raised stick and the cow runs away from that he says in most cases no distinction between the pandit and the animal when we come under pressure we react as our instincts are not <laughs> not with what we have learned. not what with what we have learned from, you know our education does not come into play there and then his answer was asli shiksha real learning is that under pressure it under pressure it helps we react from our learning from what we have understood not from the pressures from the world temptation or terror not from the temptation and and terror in this world but from i have understood this i will live my life accordingly not from the pressures which are coming from the external world that is real education very interesting and it works what is the difference between an ordinary person and a saint it's not that the saint has knows more philosophy than the ordinary person it's that the saint can convert that philosophy into day to day activity how do we do that how do we that's why vivekananda man, uh, had defined religion as the manifestation of the divinity already within us not knowledge knowledge we have got but we are unable to manifest especially under pressure all vedanta goes away how that vedanta will not go away how we will be able to live what americans call uh, walk the talk walk the talk that is the subject of tomorrow and day after stabilized wisdom how it will not go away under pressure and it works not only for monks or philosophers something i found that um, i mentioned covid crisis in new york emergency room doctor she told me the only thing that sustained me in that one year of crisis like battlefield the only thing that sustained me was my own spiritual practice otherwise i could not have survived so it is possible we will see how it is possible tomorrow and day after all right namaste swami this is pawan uh, first of all thank you geeta forum for the great opportunity to interact with uh, swami ji uh, so my question is as being in the field of science so i'm still unable to comprehend um, it's the mind through which we experience the uh, senses rather than the brain could you please elaborate I'm still uh, trying to uh, understand that it it is the question is it's through the mind through the mind we experience the senses rather than the brain that's what the spirituality says so but through the uh, mind we experience the senses yeah all all the senses and the all true ex- my answer will be look at your experience right now you are seeing right you are seeing this person you are hearing sound you are thinking of something some thoughts are going on all this is mind what is happening in the brain what will the neuroscientist tell you tiny electrical activity is going on in the neurons where is the connection what are you experiencing bursts of electricity or are you seeing swami hearing speech thinking of a question what is going on right now for you in your experience right now are you getting bursts of electricity no no <laughs> you are seeing you are hearing smelling tasting now that is somehow connected to the activity of brain but how people debate like right? uh, brain acts like a model as a modeler uh, tries to uh, uh, experience all the first person experience like whatever that visual experience or anything so this is where uh, we always get stuck 
I know yes. it is. Uh, there is no answer to this question. <laughs> that is the problem. That's the hard problem of consciousness. <laughs> Notice, all this equipment, in one sense, the camera is also seeing, but it has no experience of seeing. You can give in detail what is happening in the camera. You can explain it. In the brain, you cannot explain. So there is a gap, an explanatory gap between brain activity and mind. And you cannot deny it because everybody is experiencing mind. Who is mindless here? You are mind. Say, Swami, you, are, you may have mind, but you seem to be brainless. As long as I have mind, I can do without the brain. I have no use for the brain with a, without a mind. Our direct experience is mind. Who is experiencing dendrites and axons and neurons? The hardware of the brain, who is experiencing? Nobody. But what are you experiencing? Thought, sight, color, taste, smell. This is called sensory input. And where are you experiencing? What we call, all of us, we call mind. But what is the connection between this mind and sensory input and the brain? Nobody knows. What you said, it's trying to model. These are multiple theories are there. But they are theories. That, that gap, that they are making the gap, that they are trying to jump over a gap. Which is not a problem in any other science. Only in this science, it's a problem. Thank you, Swami. Hmm. Thank you. Last. Namaste, Swami. This is Aditya. Um, so, um, okay, I'll just... I can hear you, yeah. Okay. So, um, my question is, uh, Advaita has really helped me. Like, I've become more of a friend to myself. Like, um, I see less opposition. When I'm alone, or I see a tree or a cloud, okay, I feel that fundamental unity. Like, yeah, it's I, not very clear. The, okay, I, mean, I feel the fundamental unity when I'm alone. Or I like feel, feel the fundamental? Unity. Unity. It's yes. like an unbroken reality or a, like a living dream if in general. But I, w there's a lot of po moments when like you run into adversaries, like you, people like who really don't want your best interest. Then you're like, these, pe these things like grind your gears. You're like... Um, then I question the, this thing about us all being the same. So there's, there's things like politics and stuff. So people say, not everybody is your friend. So how, yeah. do, you, how do you transcend that and make mm. this? Uh, all right. So we are all one when I say that. Right. When Vedanta says we are all one, ekaha, one. But one at what level? Are we one at physical level? No, there's so many bodies here. Are we one at the personality level? No, persons are all different. Now, when you say politics, when you say rivalry, office politics, all of these things, it is between what? Is it between pure consciousness and pure consciousness? No. It is between personalities. So the pure consciousness, limited by different minds, it becomes different personalities. Same sunlight coming through the window, colored glass, you will see different colors of rays coming out. So similarly, same consciousness lighting up various kinds of minds. You will get various personalities. But what, at the level of personality, we are different. But it, what he's saying is, behind each personality is the same one consciousness. So don't say, for example, my consciousness may be the same, but I have problem. No, you, not my consciousness. You are that consciousness. Now our minds are different. And then uh, all these problems start. But the person who feels one consciousness in all beings, that person will will not have any deep sense of enmity or rivalry with anybody else. At least from your perspective, this problem is solved. Uh, others may not real realize it. Others may react to in you in very different ways. All right. So we'll then it's okay. Then my problem is gone. Then. <laughs> I, I didn't get that. No, I feel like then my problem is resolved. I thought like, you know, I have to reach an understanding with people. So. You feel that your problems dissolve? No, it's solved. It's solved, then I'm okay. Yeah. Yes, yes. Right. Actually, when you solve it for yourself, really, then your problem is solved. And then there comes the practical uh, question of how to live your life. That will, it's a skill to be, un uh, to be developed. But philosophically speaking, your problem is solved. At the existential level, your problem is solved. You don't have any problem anymore. That's a great thing. That's a great thing. Let me do a peace chant. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Ram
Arpanamastu. It was indeed a very great blessing for us today to have listened to Pujya Swamiji on the topic of Atma Vidya. So after Shravanam, let us contemplate on what we have heard today so that as Swamiji put it, it marinates well within us and prepares us for tomorrow's lecture. On behalf of Gita Jayanti, I extend our heartfelt gratitude to Swami Samachittanandaji, Sri Rajan Krishnanji, Sri Senguttuvanji for joining us today. Sincere thanks to each one of you present here for making this occasion a truly memorable one. Thank you.